We'll go ahead and grab your Bibles, turning to Mark chapter 6 today. If you're new to the sermons and our online services at Lincoln Baptist, we welcome you and glad that you could join us. Uh, please do comment, like, share, let us know that you're there so we can pray for you throughout this week. And if you're returning, thank you for coming back. And today we look forward to be able to teach some of the Bible and, and bring Bible input into your lives. Over the last few months, all the way since February, we've been looking at the Gospel of Mark. Uh, we've been learning about Jesus and his earthly ministry. Uh, so far, certainly last week, we looked at the wonderful power of Jesus to be able to heal and to raise people from the dead. We've seen his patience in dealing with the crowds. Uh, we've seen his willingness to serve and to care for the people. We've seen his compassion as he has travelled. And we've seen that nothing is impossible for our Lord Jesus Christ. As we move into chapter 6 today, we once again have a twin story going on. Firstly, we have the rejection of Jesus in his hometown, but then that moves into the sending of the disciples far and wide to spread the gospel news. So we're going to be seeing uh, rejection and we're going to be seeing acceptance today. Uh, what I hope to be able to bring from the text for you today is that devotion to Jesus means reliance on Jesus. Let me just say that again, that devotion to Jesus means reliance on Jesus. It is only in complete surrender to Jesus will we find our sharing of the gospel effective. In other words, gospel work starts at home. It starts with our own hearts and our own minds. It starts with our own soul. It starts with our own surrendering to God and our life before him before we can go out and be effective for his ministry's sake. So with that in mind, we're going to be turning to Mark chapter 6 and we're going to be taking from verse 1. He went away from there and came to his hometown and his disciples followed him. Jesus likes to travel, doesn't he? We first see him in Capernaum with the preaching of parables. He then gets on a boat and he stills a storm on the Sea of Galilee. He then gets to Gerasenes and he casts out demons. He returns back to Capernaum and he heals a 12-year-old girl, raises her from the dead and heals the unnamed woman. But now he chooses to travel from Capernaum toward his hometown. Now I want to be clear, it doesn't say his birth town. We know that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, but this is not his hometown. His hometown instead was Nazareth. Because after Herod uh, tried to kill Jesus by ordering the mass murder of young boys, the family returns to Nazareth. Uh, just look at Matthew 2.23. And he went and lived in a city called Nazareth that was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled. He shall be called a Nazarene. We also read in Luke that Jesus grew from a baby to a child in Nazareth, Luke 2.40. And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom. And having certainly a unique visit to the temple in Jerusalem, the family then returns to Nazareth for Jesus to grow through adolescence and young adulthood, Luke 2.51. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. So when we read that Jesus is travelling from Capernaum to his hometown, we know that he is travelling to Nazareth. But what I want you to see in verse 1 is the interesting language at the end of the verse. The disciples followed him. It doesn't say that they went with Jesus to Nazareth. Rather, it says they followed him. Jesus was choosing to journey from Capernaum to Nazareth. He wasn't compelled. He hadn't been asked to journey. And it certainly wasn't a group decision. Jesus had a reason for journeying to Nazareth and he wasn't yet ready to tell the disciples why they were going. And so the disciples, fully willing, followed Jesus. They allowed Jesus to take the lead and they allowed him to choose what they were going to do next and where they were going to next. The disciples, in some senses, were showing submission to Jesus and they were following him to Nazareth. Verse 2. And on the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How were such mighty works done by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, and Joseph, and uh, Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offence to him. While Jesus was in Nazareth, he went to the synagogue and began to teach. 
it's not particularly unusual that he did this because we see Jesus quite often in the synagogue teaching the scriptures, but we also see him externally outside by the seaside uh, teaching the people all about God and the Holy Scriptures. But what I want you to see once again here is the reaction of the people. We have a twofold reaction. The first thing they, the, that we see in the people is that they heard Jesus. They literally heard his teaching. And when they heard him teach, they were astonished. Or another word that we could use here is that they were captivated. Jesus taught with authority and with wisdom, not known to any other man. And it was astonishing to hear. And they heard of his healings. They heard of his casting out of demons. And now they were hearing him expound scripture and breathing new life like no one else had ever done before. So when they heard Jesus, they were astonished. But then notice what happened. They went from hearing to seeing. They began to recognise Jesus. Is this not the carpenter? The one who trained under his father Joseph for possibly two decades? Slowly the teacher was becoming the tradesman. But in questioning uh, Jesus and his trade, they were actually challenging his lack of formal teaching under a rabbi. But Jesus hadn't become a student under a rabbi. He was the word. He was the word that was born into human form. So he could be a living sacrifice, but yet the people didn't recognize this. Uh, John 1.14 says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as the only son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So they were questioning Jesus' teaching and his background and his learning, yet they were not realising that Jesus was the Word of God. That is why he was able to bring such new life into the Scriptures. But then they asked the question, isn't this the son of Mary and doesn't he have his brothers? The tradesman was now becoming a normal person. However, there's more to this phrase than meets the eye. In the times of Jesus, it was commonplace to refer to someone as a son or daughter of their father. To reference the mother deemed offensive and was a hint to an illegitimate child. This was possibly at the starting of gossip as to who Jesus was and where he came from, possibly slander against Mary, but it certainly was not said with reverence for Jesus. This was an offensive remark to say that he was the son of Mary. And then it says, look, his sisters are here. Jesus had gone from captivating the crowd to just an average guy with an average life, no different from anybody else. And then crucially, see how they went from being captivated and astonished by everything they were hearing to being offended by Jesus. The people had heard the deity of Jesus, but when they saw his humanity, they rejected him. Verse 4. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honour except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. I find it quite intriguing here that Jesus references himself as a prophet. For we know that he knows that he is more than a prophet. However, I don't think Jesus is stating that he is merely a prophet. Rather, his ministry, in part, was one of a prophet. Remember, a prophet takes a message from God and gives it to the people for a specific reason chosen by God. I just remember our midweek teaching series and how Jonah, the prophet, took a message from God, took it to Nineveh, sought Nineveh to hear that message, and Nineveh repented from their sins because the prophet spoke into that moment. And so Jesus here is teaching the scripture, taking the message from God and giving it to the people. In some senses, and in part, his ministry was one of a prophet. That doesn't mean he is only a prophet. It simply means that he took part in a role of a prophet. However, in the case of Jesus here, his prophecy, his message from God is not being honoured. He had honour just about everywhere he went. He had the message trusted. People were captivated. People wanted to see Jesus, but not in his hometown. It must have come as quite a blow to see that his home people, his, his family, his friends rejected the message of the gospel and therefore were rejecting Jesus himself. The problem was they couldn't get past his humanity. They could only see the boy that grew up, the tradesman who built the houses, a son, a brother, a friend. They could only see the humanity, they couldn't see the deity of Jesus. 
and they became offended because the member of their community that they knew well or they thought they knew well was now presenting them with authority and with wisdom that they were the gospel message, that they were the Messiah, that, that in them that they would find new life. And the people took offence, not because Jesus was speaking incorrectly, not because what he was saying was a lie, but because all they could see was that he was a human being. Verse 5, and he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief, and he went about among the villages teaching. Incredibly, Jesus doesn't continue his ministry in Nazareth. He doesn't uh, sink his uh, feet into uh, concrete and just stay there and keep teaching. Instead, he moves on. It's not that he didn't want to. It's rather he couldn't. Now, don't be mistaken, Jesus doesn't lose power here. He doesn't lose ability. He hasn't been usurped. There isn't a situation here where the, the almighty Lord Jesus can't do something. Rather, the people simply had no faith. They've completely rejected Jesus and his authority. There's no atmosphere of faith, no desire of the Son of God, just complete rejection. And while marveling or being astonished and such, uh, uh, such unbelief, Jesus still heals a few sick people. Was there some in the crowd that did believe in Jesus? Or was this Jesus just simply showing some compassion? We're not quite sure, it's probably a mix of both, but what is clear is this wonderful ministry that we saw by uh, Capernaum and Gerasenes was not going to happen in Nazareth. Having com been completely rejected by his own people, Jesus continues to travel and to teach the scripture and to breathe new life by means of the gospel message. He travels from village uh, to town because the gospel message must be spread. Uh, before moving into the second half of this passage and really a kind of second storyline, I want you to see something here. Jesus didn't just throw out miracles to anyone who wanted them. He wasn't some magical being that entertained the crowds with signs and wonders. He was compassionate and showed great prayer for his creation. He drew alongside the neediest and he graced them with healing. Not for a show, but out of love and compassion. There is nothing greater than the creator God seeking to have a loving and intimate relationship with cre his creation. To heal them, to show compassion to them and to give them sight of what new life would be like. The people of Nazareth completely missed it. But we know from the healing of the sick that still many were becoming believers in Jesus. Let's just continue now into our second scene. We're moving from the rejection of Jesus now into the sending out of the disciples. Verse 7. And he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over unclean spirits. In Mark chapters 1 through 5, Jesus called the disciples, where in chapters 6 through 16, he then sends them out to do the ministry of the gospel. Jesus was sending out the, the, the disciples into a mission of a lifetime. They were to go into the surrounding villages and towns and to continue the ministry that they have witnessed. They were to preach the gospel and they were to do all that Jesus had done. Verse 7 and the next few verses after that state the specific instructions that Jesus gave them. Uh, firstly, they were to go in pairs. Uh, we also see this in Luke 7, 18, John 1, 35 and Mark 11, 1. The disciples were not to be lone rangers. Rather, they were to work together for the gospel. We can really take this in two ways. First, that, that ministry should, be not, should not be built around one person, but around the message that is proclaimed. I remember Francis Chan leaving his church of 5,000 because he felt that the people relied on him rather than on Jesus. They wanted to hear Francis Chan rather than hear the voice of God. By going out in pairs, Jesus was preventing the disciples from becoming puffed up and the people from becoming captivated by the person rather than the message. We can also recognise though the human frailty in ministry and travel. I've been a pastor now for uh, just over seven years, uh, but before becoming uh, into full-time ministry, I worked several different jobs. As a student, I worked on a farm and in a zoo. I took an evening job delivering pizza. I worked as a groundskeeper, and after graduation, uh, we moved to London and I worked in the financial district in London. I've had a, a varied and eclectic uh, working life. 
But what I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt, that the most exhausting, the most time consuming, the most debilitating and the role that takes the most out of me is being a pastor. Now don't worry, I, I absolutely love what I do. The point I'm trying to make is that ministry for Jesus is not for the faint hearted. The disciples couldn't do it on their own. They needed help. They needed a companion to encourage them to keep going and to pick them up when they faltered. We see this in the life of Moses when he needed uh, two individuals to lift up his arms so that he could continue the ministry that God had placed before him. Serving Jesus in ministry is exhausting and it needs help. And so Jesus sent them out in pairs to ensure that they could keep going, that they could stay on task, stay on mission, and that their human frailty wouldn't stop the message spreading. The second instruction that we see here, or rather less an instruction and more permission, was given to the authority of casting out demons. The disciples had no ability without the authority of Jesus. So Jesus gave them authority to cast out the demons. This wasn't about strength and ability. This was about Jesus and what he could do through the disciples. They would only be effective in their ministry if they acted in and through Jesus. Adil Moody said that this way, when a man has no strength, if he leans on God, he becomes powerful. The disciples had no strength of their own. Only a short while ago, uh, we see them trembling in the middle of the storm and questioning Jesus in the healing of the unnamed woman. However, if they rely on Jesus, upon the authority of Jesus and work through him, then they could become powerful to the point of casting out demons. Let's continue these instructions in verse 8. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. The disciples were not to prepare for a long journey. Their task was urgent and it was close by. They were not to take food or resources or money. They were not to even take extra clothes because they wouldn't need them. They were to travel light wearing sandals and taking a staff with them. There was a real sense of urgency in Jesus' command. The disciples were not to care about personal well-being. They were to be sacrificial. They were to be ready to go because Jesus had now commissioned them for the work of the gospel. I wonder if sometimes we get ministry backwards. We send people to theological college. We ask them to undertake training and internships. We compel them to undertake courses and write up studies. And only after they've done all of these things do we release them into ministry a little by little, whether in church or further afield. Now, let me be clear. I think training is an excellent thing. However, what we need to learn here from Jesus is that reliance on Jesus is far better because Jesus is all powerful and has all authority. The disciples had some training from Jesus and some learning, but it was not about them. It was about putting into practice what Jesus was teaching them. They were to rely on Jesus and not on earthly comforts. They were work, to work in him and through him, not because they have letters after their name, but because Jesus is all powerful and he would work through them. They were to do the work of Jesus. They were to do it immediately. They were to do it without delay because Jesus, the son of God, the Messiah, was sending them out on the task of a lifetime to share the gospel message. Verse 10, and he said to them, whether you enter a house, stay there until you depart there. And if any place will not receive you and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. The disciples were to accept lodgings wherever it was offered. They were not to seek better. This was not about comfort. This was about the work. While traveling, if they were not offered lodgings, they were to continue on to the next place. They were not to stay anywhere that the message of the gospel and biblical truth was rejected, as exemplified in Jesus leaving Nazareth. The disciples were to take the gospel where it would be effective, where people would accept it. And so hearts would turn to the kingdom and would turn to God. And when it was rejected, they were to dust off their sandals. This, this idea that they were leaving them behind, that, they, that, that God's judgment was given to them because they had made their decision of rejection. And then they were to move on to the next place. Because in absolute terms here, the gospel was not going to be watered down and it was not going to be changed. You were either rejecting or accepting. Acceptance brought glory to God and rejection brought judgment on the people. Verse 12. 
So they went out and proclaimed that the people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. Little is said about the disciples and, and actually what they preached other than they preached repentance. They preached what the master preached, that the good news had come, that God had provided a way of forgiveness and the people should repent and turn from their sins. And with authority of Jesus, the disciples cast out demons and healed the sick, following not only the command, but the example of Jesus. Did you see here the two scenes that we've been given? The rejection of Jesus by his own people and the commissioning of the disciples to, to go into gospel ministry and to go into all people and spread the good news. The job that we have to do today is to figure out what this means to us. I don't want just an academic teaching. I don't want you just to have knowledge of these verses. Rather, we need to be learning of these verses, growing in our knowledge of God so that we can be daily sanctified or, or made more like Jesus in our daily lives. We need to learn to, to apply these verses. What does it mean that, that there was rejection of Jesus? What does it mean to be commissioned out to the gospel and for the gospel's sake? And so to do that, what we need to do is apply these passages to our lives, praying that God will use the application to change us, to renew us and to make us more like Jesus. And so I have four very quick points and here's uh, number one. How do you respond to Jesus? The heart of today's message is a gospel message. How do we respond to it? I will never grow tired in inviting people to consider once again what Jesus means to them. Last week, two, commi two people committed their lives to Jesus. What does that mean? It means that they recognised that they are a sinner, that they have done wrong against God and that they are broken, that they are not perfect and they have not met God's holy standard. They've been humbled by their sin and they know that there is no way for them to make it better. The only way to be right with God is to repent or to turn away from their sin and seek forgiveness in Jesus. And then in placing their faith in Jesus, they find themselves forgiven and set free to live a joy-filled life. So here's the question. What about you? Do you reject Jesus like the town of Nazareth? Or do you place your faith in Jesus? William Craig, a theologian, said, Faith is trust or commitment to what you think is true. So let me ask you today, what do you think is true? Who is Jesus? John 14, 6 says, Jesus said to them, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There is no other way, no other truth and no other life. And it boils down to the simple yet profound question. Do you accept or do you reject Jesus, the Son of God? Our prayer is that today, right now, you would make the decision to accept Jesus, to humble yourself before him and to find forgiveness and peace and new life in Jesus. I would ask that you do not delay because you do not know what tomorrow is going to bring. None of us expected 2020 to be as it is now. Don't delay. Don't leave it too late. Don't leave it till tomorrow. Answer the question, do you accept or do you reject Jesus as Lord and Saviour? And the second thing I want us to consider is this. Expect rejection. We don't like rejection, do we? It's discouraging and it's demoralising. The issue we find is that we want people to agree with us. We want people to accept us. We want people to like us. We want people to validate our beliefs and our thinking. We're so wrapped up in our identity that we crave for people to recognise us and to accept us. However, for the Christian, we are not to find our identity in ourselves. Rather, we are to find it in Jesus. Galatians 2.20 I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It is important that you recognise this because in this world, the Bible guarantees that not only will you be rejected, but you'll be hated for even associating with Jesus. John 15.18 if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. 
If you were at the world, if you were in the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. The world rejects you. In fact, the world hates you because you are no longer of the world. You are of Jesus. The world rejects Jesus, so the world rejects you. And if you don't recognise your identity in Jesus, as I was saying before, then this will utterly crush you, the world's rejection. You'll be completely broken by the level of hatred that is given to you and to Jesus. However, with conviction, if you see your identity in Jesus, you will not only be able to enjoy the splendour of Jesus, no matter the number of fiery arrows heading your way, but you'll also be able to recognise it is not you that is being rejected. It is Jesus that's being rejected and that people hate you because they are convicted by the gospel message. Do you recognise that in our story today, that the people of Nazareth were offended by Jesus, not because of Jesus. They knew who he was. They knew him as a person. They were offended, therefore they rejected him, therefore they hated him because of the gospel message that he taught. So when the gospel is rejected, the people are rejected. Rejection from the world, though, is not surprising. But I think to some, it is surprising that those within the church will also do some rejecting. 2 Timothy 4 says, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but have itching ears. They will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. And let me tell you, we are in this time. We're in a time where people take parts of the Bible they don't like and twist them or even completely ignore their significance. We're in a time when people no longer want to live by sound doctrine, choosing instead to look at what society wants. We're in a time when more and more we are watering down scripture so it becomes more palatable. And let me tell you this, scripture is not palatable. Scripture is offensive towards society because it teaches that society lives in sin. To many Christians, we've fallen into this trap. They feel uncomfortable with a passage or disagree with a passage, and so they reject it. Because the world has rejected them, they feel that they must reject the message, the, the centrality of Scripture, the, the Bible truths that they read. They twist them so that it's more palatable, so they can be accepted by the world. However, I want you to consider these words by Francis Chan in his book, Multiply. Reading your Bible with humility means that you're assuming the role of a student. Too often we search the Bible to find agreement with the views we already hold. This is backward. Instead, we need to recognise that we know nothing. We don't have the answers. That's why we are reading the Bible. Approaching the Bible with humility means that we are laying aside our agendas and looking for what God will teach us. Every time you find yourself struggling to accept something the Bible says, you've found an area of your life that needs to be brought into submission to Christ. The real test, when you find that your beliefs or lifestyle don't match the Bible, do you assume that the Bible is wrong? Every time we find ourselves disagreeing with God, we can be certain that we are the ones who need to change. Here's my point, folks. The world is going to reject you because it rejects Jesus. Beware, therefore, of rejecting the word of God so that you can find acceptance in this world. We here at Lincoln Baptist are going to preach and teach the Bible. We're not ashamed of it and we're going to continue to do it as long as there is breath in my lungs. Because God's word is the only truth. It is the only way. It is the only life. It is not our job to twist it and make it more palatable. It's not our job to take the Bible and slam it into community and try and figure out how we'll get acceptance. It won't work because the Bible is rejected because people hate Jesus. And so we present them with the gospel and we leave it up to God to work on their hearts. We don't change the message. We need to make sure of that, folks, that as we recognise and expect rejection, we don't take the Bible and change it to mean that we will be accepted. We do as the disciples did. We continue to preach the gospel. We continue to teach sound doctrine. And we move on from a place where it is completely rejected to the next place where God will take us. 
Uh, the number three thing I want us to consider is the work is for Jesus and it's in Jesus. What we see in Mark 6 is really an outworking of the Great Commission, Matthew 28. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. We are to take this wonderful gospel and we are to go. By the authority of Jesus, we are to spread the news far and wide. We're not to spread opinion or some sham of a gospel. We are to spread the gospel of Jesus, the good news of salvation in his name. We are to baptise and we are to welcome people into the kingdom of God. We are then to teach them all that the Bible holds within it. We don't teach opinion, we teach truth. We don't teach what is popular, we teach what is needed. We don't teach an interpretation, we teach the words of God. Again, we need to beware of our motives here. The work is for Jesus, it is for his kingdom. All too often we make the mistake of building a mini kingdom for ourselves. The disciples in Mark 6 were not building a mini kingdom, they were expanding the kingdom of God. All for Jesus really quite simply sums it up. If we're not working all for Jesus, then we're working for something or someone else. Let me encourage you to be all for Jesus, to work through Jesus, to work for Jesus, to serve Jesus, to serve his kingdom. Because as we accept Jesus, as we recognise that the gospel will be rejected by this world, but we are to plough on all the same, then we're to recognise it's for Jesus. Because if it's not for Jesus, we will give up far too easily. But because it is for Jesus, and it's by the authority of Jesus, and it's by the power of Jesus, we can find the strength to keep going in gospel ministry. Uh, My fourth and final point is this. Sacrifice is needed, but joy is given. The disciples gave up their families, their homes and their businesses. They were sent out without comforts and without resources, yet they had the privilege of serving the Lord Jesus. We are called to go out. Know that it will come at a great sacrifice. However, if we check our attitude, we will see that sacrifice can be joy. Philippians chapter 3 and from verse 7. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. And by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Nothing in this life is worth anything in comparison to Jesus. Do you believe that today? If you do, do you live that? What if Jesus asked for your house, your wealth, your time? your family, your skills? Would you give Jesus all of these things? The work will require sacrifice. Yet look at the joy found in Jesus. Everything else is counted as rubbish because knowing Jesus is joy filling. That being with Jesus is the ultimate goal. The question simply boils down to where do you place your hope? In this world and the things you can see? on the life that is promised and it is coming as eternal life in Jesus. Our passage in Mark 6 teaches us that not everything in the Christian life will be easy, but it will be absolutely worth it when we are all for Jesus. Let's pray today. Father, we do thank you for this wonderful uh, chapter, Mark 6. We thank you for what it teaches us. We thank you that we are to not uh, uh, water down the gospel, but we are to uh, take it up, that by your authority and your power, we are to spread it far and wide. Father, we thank you that we have the privilege of doing that task. We thank you for entrusting it to us with the Great Commission. And Father, we pray that we would honour your word, that we would honour your commission, and that we would go out and we would bring people to you, making disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, let it not be that we make disciples of our own mini kingdom, but let all disciples follow you, the true Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that when we are rejected, that we won't be tempted to water down the message, that we won't be tempted to try and make it palatable and not offensive to this world. But Father, we pray that we would be comforted by you and that we would be set on the task of our lifetime to continue the ministry of Jesus wherever we go. 
Father, we do pray this in your glorious name. To the one who has all authority, we pray. Amen.